Thank you, Saskia, for this kind introduction. So welcome, everyone. My name is Dragan Kostic. I hope you do hear me. If you don't hear me good, please let me know. So again, my compliments to Kivin Iria for organizing this event and organizing us, people who do robotics, uh, to contribute to this Friday in April. Uh, I must say we have today a rather luxury event because besides my oral talk, we will have a real live demo. Demo donated by Segula Technologies and provided by Tech United, our world known team of roboticians. So my talk consists of several topics. I will first introduce the company which was generous enough to organize this uh, robotics presentation. And then I will zoom into the particular type of the robots, robot that use legs for locomotion, actually two legs, which is extremely difficult. I will present a little bit of history of these robots, then I will talk a little bit about uh, use competitions of these robots at the RoboCup. I will talk a little bit about technology and then also appearances of these robots in media, in art, at exhibitions. So I am architect mechatronics for the Segula Technologies Netherlands. That's originally the French company which operates in 19 countries and headquarter for Benelux is here at the high-tech campus. Now we have a rather broad palette of activities and as this diagram shows almost 50% of our activities are in aerospace, in automotive, in defense. But in Benelux with the headquarter in building 5 which is opposite of the, on the other side of the lake, we have a center of excellence for high tech. So here we have several competencies like system architecture, analysis, think about CFD, thermal FEM analysis. We have a lot of activities in mechanics and mechatronics and design of and development of electronics and design and development of the software. At the moment we have around 50 employees but we have rather uh, ambitious um, growth plan. So we hope that next year, this time, we could accommodate even twice more of people. That's our ambition, yeah? And we find the reasons why that is reasonable ambition, yeah? Now, you see, I will talk today about robots. And it turns out that the robots were one everlasting vision. Even Aristotle, in simpler words, was thinking about some artificial device which could do job for us automatically. So he said, if we could have some tool which could do things for us and which could uh, perform labor instead of us, then we will no need, have no need for paid workers or at that time for slaves. So that was the concept actually of the robot. And that vision technically is the right vision. That is our drive why we do want robots. We want robots to have artificial substitute of us, to carry out work for us which is either tedious or dangerous or boring, some substitute. And then in the period of Renaissance, this great Leonardo da Vinci, he made actually the real concept of the robot. In this case, that was artificial night. And he made reasonably good drive trains. Drive train is a mechanism which transfers the actuator, so power of the actuator to the mechanical movement of the robot. He sketched them and if our mechanical expert inspect these drive trains nowadays, they still say, okay, this does not differ too much from what we do now. And he do that a couple centuries ago. But at that time, that was more or less a vision, a dream. 
And then we came to the 20th century, and then we said, let's make these dreams and vision in, let's bring it to reality. Then this Czech drama writer who went in the years of, at the beginning of the 20th century to United States, he wrote a play, Rosum's Universal Robots. He made one pessimistic play where he described these artificial workers without any conscience as slaves carry out the labor in the factories. But at one point of time, they become conscious and they, yeah, do not obey any longer the orders from their masters. And he called these artificial uh, workers robots. Robots is derived, the word robot is derived from the Slavic word rabota, which means work or labor. So robot actually means worker. Okay? And then immediately after being introduced in one so-called science fiction play, these robots start to appear in all media. Then already in 26, this masterpiece of science fiction industry has appeared. And in this movie, this robot Maria, actually that is android type of the robot appeared. And in this movie, it symbolized a little bit of evil. Now it's a bit strange effect. You have a robot which has female characteristics <laughs> and represents evil in the movie. It's a bit strange. I did not like that. But if you did not see Metropolis, please do, do, do that, because it's a really masterpiece, and most likely you already saw a sequences of this movie in the uh, Radio Gaba, Gaga video of The Queen. So they combined the uh, yeah, shots from this movie with the video. Then in 77, they filmed this masterpiece, uh, Star Wars. And in that star, they introduced these two cutest robots ever in the world. I remember when I saw this movie in 78, I said, oh, how nice would be that I one day start taking care of these. So then with my age of nine, I already envisioned my future career. So then I decided I need to take care of the robots. And then, yeah, I decided to do that. So, uh, you know, I was assistant professor at the university, and now again, part-time, I'm teaching robotics there. This movie was made in 76, 77, it was broadcasted. So the students who are now attending the courses, they were not even born in this year. So at that time, everyone knew that the names of these robots are R2-D2 and C3PO. And nowadays, students even do not know their name. So I told them, a bottom line to pass the course on robotics, you should know the names of these robots, because <laughs> these are the most famous robots in the world, although they do not exist in reality. Yeah? But now the robots do that exist in, the rob in reality, were conceptually introduced after this Russian writer, who also immigrated to the States, wrote a book about the robots, and then he introduced free laws. And, you know, I use this slide also at the lecture, and then I invite the whole audience, all students, to read these laws together with me. Because these laws represent a system level requirement on one robot. And if you look at the robots nowadays, each of these robots fulfills these system level requirements. Now, I will not invite you to read these laws, but I will read this for you. A robot may not harm a human being or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. Quite logical. Second system requirement. A robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. Again, extremely good system requirement. And the third, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first and the second law. So when you 
read the system level requirement of any robot, it naturally fulfilled these things. So it was introduced in science fiction and then became reality. So that is, in my opinion, the first relation between imagination of people and real life technology. But then step further, in 1950, this Tony Sale, this gentleman, this photo was made two years ago, he made the first robot which could walk and could even talk in United Kingdom. And uh, you see it looks like that Tin Man from Wizard of Oz, but it was certainly operational. And the media informed us a year ago that this guy, after a little bit application of lubricants and cleaning of corrosion, could let this robot walk on the BBC a year ago. So for 50 years, 60 years it was in some garage and now is all then operational. But this robot had actually sticks, stick legs. He could walk only like this. It was not specially exciting, although could certainly look amazing in the year 1950. But the real beginning of this nowadays walking robot, surprisingly enough, begins in the country where do I come from, and that is Serbia. So I will play you now the video of something which is called active exoskeleton. This video was taped in, actually it was filmed in 72, and they made the very first system which was capable to have the balance and try to walk for the person, purpose of either rehabilitation or as an aid of walking this balance of people who are disabled with walking. That was the very first idea of walking robots. So walking robots were introduced in the practice not to let the robot walk everywhere, but to help people, to help their impairments. And now, in this period, 69 till 74, now you hear a little bit of my native language, <laughs> but I will, this video is rather long. This was a nice example. So that was a person who had disabled legs. You see, he could not walk. He was paraplegic. And then they put him in this so-called active exoskeleton, and with this exoskeleton, he could at least have a locomotion. So I will, yeah. You see, the machine was giving him these steps and with this rollator he was keeping the balance. Because you can imagine the year 72, it was quite difficult to make this exoskeleton which is stable enough to stabilize it, to keep it in balance. But funny thing with this demonstration, at that time, scientific director of NASA visited that lab and he wanted to buy this exoskeleton for further research in the United States. And then he bought this, but on the margins of his diary, he wrote that he never in his life saw such scared person as this poor guy who was walking. Because can you imagine, he did not have any senses below and you let the machine start moving you. Mm -hmm. That must look terrifying. <laughs> because at that time there was no active force feedback. So the active exoskeleton could not adapt to the uh, yeah, wishes of the, of the walker. But this was the beginning. At that time they made this exoskeleton and they made mathematical fundamentals of the walking robot and all current walking robots are still walking using mathematical concepts that were introduced at that time. Now, as you all know, this year we have a big event in Eindhoven. We have international competition of the robots and the most of these robots will be the walking robots. This competition started officially in 97 <laughs> in Japan and at that time there were 38 teams from 11 countries and this competition was introduced with one general objective. An objective is to, by year 2050, we need to have 11 robots playing football 
against the world champion and these robots need to win. So that is the challenge more for, I would say, popularization of the event. Real objective is to stimulate research and technological development around robotics, artificial intelligence, autonomy, and so forth. So in 97, that was the attendance of the RoboCup, but in Eindhoven, at the end of the June, we will have more than 400 teams from more than 40 countries, for more than 2,500 participants. So entrance is free of charge, and Segway is one of the generous sponsors of the event, so everyone are welcome to spend some time at the end of the June at the Indoor Sports Centrum and to see these robots in action. So what can you expect there? You can expect several competitions. You can have, have robots playing soccer, and then the robots doing the rescuing task like this. Robot competing at domestic, at home tasks, like this Cosero from Germany, or Amigo that you will <coughs> see soon in action. You can see some junior robots, demos, sponsored, but for soccer robots, you have different activities, different competitions, and each competition puts accent on particular discipline. For instance, this standard platform uses these so-called now robots. These are commercial robots produced in France, and these robots are playing game team against team, and they walk on two legs, but you do not have too much control about their balance. They are mostly driven by vision, they search for the ball and they do things as you see. Yeah? But here is more accent on strategy, on action, on collaboration, of tactics. These elements are here emphasized. Yeah? Fine? Okay, now a little bit about middle size. So this is a real proud of Holland. These are the world champions, the robots with the blue lights. They won World Cup last year and we hope they will yeah, repeat the result this year in the Netherlands. These robots are extremely fast. They communicate, they have interaction, they have action. So please come by and see them. But mine special interest is on the robots of this kind. These are so-called teen-sized humanoids that play games two against two. <laughs> you see, the, ro the red robot was actually broken. It has a right to save by yeah, falling down, but there is a time limit, a couple of seconds it needs to stand up again. And it was broken, so it was not allowed. So that was actually, they had to move it, and now this, go this German robot will score. So you see how does it score. <laughs> But my real, real, real interest are these biggest robots. These are so-called adult-sized robots. Robots with 30 kilos and up, with a height 1 meter, meter 20 and above. These robots play one against another one, one on one, and their actions are very complicated because any centimeter of adding the height means technological change in controlling and in the difficulty of controlling these robots. If you put the center of gravity higher, it's much more difficult to keep the balance. And now we see one complete action. You know, this action takes two minutes. So I will kill two minutes of your time, but I do it on purpose. Because when I look, watch this two minutes video, I'm burning inside because I'm looking at the technical detail, details and I'm impressed with the performance of these robots. On the other hand, a lot of other people would say, I would rather look at the 
yeah. Color getting dry on the wall than on this section. Here is nothing exciting. But believe me, this is really the high tech. This is really dealing with the edge of the possible with the, with the robots. And this is amazing that this robot can place the ball in the half of the opponent, approach it reasonably fast, find the goal and score. So let's see this great Charlie from United States, University of Virginia. <laughs> Fine? Cool? Now about technology of walking. So, I mean, if what I will tell you now is not rocket science, everyone should be aware of what walking means. But still, for walking it's important to identify some special features. First, walking means that at any point of time, at least one leg must be on the ground. So walking is different from running. Running is identified in that sense that there exist phases when both feet are above the ground. And your velocity of your center of the mass is technically parallel with the ground. That is different from jumping. In jumping, you also have both feet above the ground, but your center of the mass is pointing upwards. So that is walking. Yeah? Maybe we were not aware that this is walking. <laughs> but this is walking. I want to introduce two terms that are, say, professional terms in the field of walking. And the first term is gait. Gait means the way how we do walk. Do I walk like this? I walk like this. I walk like this. So that's the way of walking. So that is simply the combination of all motions in my joints and the final la. How does it look like? How do I walk? The second is support polygon. Support polygon is the space on the ground, which is, yeah, encircled by my feet. If I'm sit standing on both feet on the ground, all this envelope, complete envelope here will be support polygon. If I'm standing on one feet, only that sole of that feet will be support polygon. If I'm standing on a few fingers, only that piece which is on the ground will be there, will be support polygon. Why these two guys are important? For the following. So, yeah, following will come on the next slide. Let me remind you what are the walking phases. You have double support, you have pre-swing, you have swing, which is a single support, that is the phase, which is typically the most difficult. Then you have post-swing and again double support. So if you want to walk, you need to have this periodic gait. You need to move from double support, pre-swing, swing, post-swing, post and then you change the leg. The another leg will become stand leg, yeah? And then I come to the most fundamental criterion for balance, for stability of walking. And this criterion contains the only mathematical formula I prepared for you today. And it should be at the secondary school level, so I hope everyone will understand it. To define what means stable walking. Stable walking means that at the moment of my locomotion, no other, my extremity touches the ground besides my feet, soles of the feet. This is the sole of the feet, yeah? So I am not walking if I'm doing this according to definition, right? And then for any phase of that walking, I can apply this simple model. This model represents one cart moving on one platform 
that platform has certain support of this width. And this platform is not glued to the ground. So it can tip over if, yeah, if the center of the mass is above the support. And this thing actually represents a person walking. This mass, this cart, represents our center of the mass during the walking. And this support represents our support polygon. And check this out. I will write one equation. And this equation tells me what is the moment at this point. Moment which arises due to the gravity acting on this mass and due to the inertial force. So you see, we do fall due to the gravity. If there won't be a gravity, we will not fall. So if I'm here, I'm falling due to the gravity. But I'm using my inertial force not to fall. So I say I'm moving in this direction. So my speed and acceleration of the center of the mass is in that direction. And now, what is the direction of the inertial force? Can someone tell me? Hmm? So there were 50% chances and the right answer is opposite. <laughs> so inertial force acts, you, acts always opposite from the direction of motion. If I'm moving that direction, I need to invest myself because my body does not want to move. That actually means it goes there. So for this direction of acceleration, inertial force acts at this direction and it is simply equal mass times acceleration. And then the moment, as we all know, is the force times the arm. Here is the arm, is this height. And for other moment, which is due to the gravity, we have this force times the arm. And arm is this distance, position of the center of the mass minus this position P. So, if I put the requirement that this moment, resultant moment, should be equal to zero, then from this expression, I will get this equation. This equation will give me the position of point P. And this position, this point P is called zero moment point. That is the point where no moment exists which will let this support to tip over. So if I'm walking, I'm actually utilizing my inertial force, which acts backwards, to compensate for the gravity. And I get technically one point at my support polygon, at my feet, where this total moment about this direction and this direction are zero. If they are equal to zero, I will not tip over. And that point is called zero moment point, and we use this criterion to make the desired movement of the robot. From this requirement, we determine the desired trajectory of the center of the mass of the robot. If we know that, we can easily map that to the movement of all the limbs and all the joints. So this is the mathematical mechanism of walking. Ensure that the zero moment point is always in the support polygon. If it is in support polygon, I will not tip over. If it goes about the po support polygon, my support polygon will start to tip over and I will start to fall. Yeah? So, for stability of walking, make sure that the ZMP, zero moment point, remains within the support polygon. Now, having in, mind, having in mind how much time is, I will still like to talk five more minutes. Uh, you see, Making the robot walk is not a trivial thing. And besides making the mechanism, which is fine, besides uh, providing actuators that are strong and still light enough, you need to write a lot of control software. And since the robot is moving, 
these movements are typically described with rather complicated coordinate transformations. So then the control software can be very computationally intensive. And we developed some tools that make these very complicated coordinate transformations represent in a rather compact form. For that we use computer algebra, symbolic computations. We can use any tooling for symbolic computation like MAPLE, Mathematic and Symbolic Toolbox. And using this tooling we can automatically generate all key algorithms for robotics. I will not bother you what is this, but this is a nice example that our algorithms are then automatically represented in the compact form. For instance, if you have expression like this, which has several appearances of sinus 5x and cosinus 2x, our software will first find these trigonometric functions, declare them only once, and substitute them. So instead of computing sinus 5x two times and sin cosinus 2x two times, which can be rather computationally intensive, it will do it only once and then does this. But then it goes even further. It will make a new, uh, yeah, it will recognize new common term, execute it only once, and then you see, you have only these five expressions that need to be executed instead of this very long one. And we have tooling which does that automatically. And that tooling is used for development of the control software of the robots. So when you make a robot and you make a kind of the gate, you never let the robot you never test this gate directly on the robot. You need to have the model to test if the gate is stable. And that's why we have first the software to animate, to test if the gate looks pro good. And here we can observe different criteria. We can observe the position of the ZMP, that is the red point and center of the mass of the robot. As long as the red point remains within the support polygon, you see the support polygon in double phase, consists of two leg feet and envelopes around them. If it is, this is a double phase, and now in the swing phase, there is only one feet is the sole. As long as rod red point remains there, that should say that's, that's a balance. So going back to simulation, to, to, this is a video taped two years ago with a robot which was supposed today to be here with us. And I don't know what's going on now. I I'm afraid it has to do with some resolution here. This is really, really unfortunate. Mm. Yeah. Really sad. I don't understand why is this, why does it look like this now? It was not supposed to look like this. Ah, oh, bad. Doesn't matter. The last slide. You know, these walking robots attract too much attention. So when you do this kind of technology, you will be invited, of course, by the folks Krant, who will put you on the front page of the Saturday issue, because nothing happened in the Netherlands, and then they invented the t topic. They say, we make machines, Dutch machines, after in a couple of decades, then they even invite you to, uh, yeah, to the magazine for fashion and lifestyle. So there's a magazine for fashion and lifestyle in, in, in Belgium, and they had an issue, special issue about the skin. So skin issue, and there you have all kinds of topics about the skin. So yeah, let's browse a little bit. I mean, you see, you have artistic photos, and among all these photos, they will put also the robots. And not any robot, but our robot, our tulip, which is here. So, yeah, <laughs> and the title of this article was Our Brother Under New Skin, Machine Skin. It is also interesting that this arm, which you see here, is a Philips arm, and that is the previous version of the arm which is on this robot. That's also funny. But then you also got, uh, yeah, attracted or approached by artists like this Belgian artist Vincent Fournier, who traveled the world 
and he made the photos of all kinds of the robots worldwide. So check this out, how cool robots this guy uh, photographed. This is his official website. So very cute, very nice, very expensive robots <laughs> on all kind of, in all kinds of environments. And surprisingly enough, also our robot is on his web page. So that's quite nice and that makes us also very happy and proud. But what made us extremely proud was a performance which took place in 2010 at the Stripe Festival. Festival in Eindhoven, where our robot was performing the act, dance act, with Miss Rose Van Berkel. She's a choreographer, ballet dancer, and national expert in human movement. And at that time, with the very limited uh, capabilities of our robot, she made a very cute and very attended uh, performance. I will go a little bit further. So that performance was given almost every day during the Strive Festival in 2010 and attracted a lot of people and it was nice that we could contribute to such an artistic event and I will play this video after our break but in the year 2011 UK Wired magazine which is the most influential magazine for popular culture in technology selected this act among first 10 acts where the robots uh, that the robots performed all around the world and that was really cute so this piece of the article is here about our tulip and yeah my conclusions these walking robots are really nice I like them very much and many people in the Netherlands will say why do we need to develop them I don't see the reason why don't we use only wheels well you know 70 percent of the territory that humans can approach are approachable by feet and only 30 percent by wheels so we need the legs for mobility and you can think of all kind of applications and all kind of impacts of these robots and that's why I do believe these robots are worthwhile of developing and worthwhile of investments and worthwhile of simply attention. So please visit them and enjoy them at the end of June in Eindhoven. And many thanks for your kind attention. Given the time, I propose that you post eventual questions on the bar after the demo of Tech United. Excuse and I appreciate your kind attention. Thanks.